this one, I think it speaks to kind of, you know, why we're doing this story, kind of the hysteria happening and people have questions about it. Uh, a Twitter user is asking, should I avoid using public transit these days? I don't think we're at that stage yet. Um, I, I certainly think the vast majority of people on trans public transit are just fine. They don't have this virus. It's very unlikely that they're going to have this virus. Um, your greater risk using public transit this time of year, to be honest, is that you're going to get the flu. And most of the time you'll get the flu because you put your hands on one of the pole in a subway car that somebody with the flu touched and you get the flu. So I think it's fine to use public transit. I think you want to use common sense. So don't touch surfaces if you can avoid it. It's winter, wear gloves. That'll really help your chance of actually touching surfaces and picking up infection. Use hand sanitizer after riding public transit. These are good ideas. Um, I, I think if we get to a point where we're starting to see you know, mass outbreaks of symptoms in the community, you know, your better answer might be, you know, you want to wear a mask, you know, an N95 type mask if you're on public transit, but we're nowhere near that yet. I think that would be a hysterical response and, and certainly not anything that anybody needs to be doing at this point in time. Why don't we be proactive and do a lockdown for 48 hours at the airport or places where people enter into Canada that come from infected areas? We know that symptoms come after 24 hours. It's a good question. It, it probably wouldn't be practical for us to be doing a lockdown of all travelers coming from those areas for 48 hours. I think the things that we should be doing is I think we probably should be thinking about stopping travel from affected areas in the first place. So much easier to just keep somebody on a hold where they're coming from versus allowing them to come here and then setting up some sort of a quarantine zone in our airport. The other thing that I think might be something to consider us using again um, is back during the SARS outbreak, we implemented thermal scanners at a lot of airports so that we could pick up people who actually had fevers as they were trying to come through immigration. It would have been effective in this case that we actually just had here in Toronto, because this is somebody who was already symptomatic when they were on the aircraft. And so one of the issues that I see at our airports right now is we are relying on patients to admit that they came from this part of the world and admit that they have a fever. So if we can proactively track where people are coming from, proactively potentially avoid travel coming in from affected parts of the world, but also proactively screen for fever, I think these are the much more effective steps for us to identify potential cases and isolate them rather than trying to quarantine incredibly large numbers of people, which just practically could not be done. Is it inevitable to contract the new virus if it's airborne? So once a person coughs or sneezes? It's definitely not inevitable. And this goes back to our previous discussion about infectivity rates of different viruses. So if we were talking about something like measles, which I mentioned before, which is the, probably one of the most infectious viruses out there, if you're not vaccinated and you're in a room with someone with measles, measles who is symptomatic, it is pretty much inevitable that you will get measles. We don't know that yet about this virus. So maybe it has the same level of infectivity as measles. And if you are in a room with somebody who's coughing, it's pretty inevitable that you're going to get it. Uh, maybe it's only 10% chance that you're going to get it. We don't know. The other thing that I mentioned before is that we also don't know if you getting infected means it's inevitable that you're going to have any symptoms at all or serious symptoms. So there's a very good chance that you could be in the room with somebody who has this illness. You could get infected and you may have no symptoms at all because we just don't know what percentage of people who are infected actually even get sick. So the answer here is that there's much more that we don't know than what we do know. Uh, but I certainly don't think anything is inevitable at this point in time. And it's certainly not inevitable that this is going to be an outbreak or inevitable that you will get sick if you're exposed. Someone said, and I think it's in reference to a gentleman uh, yesterday, our first case, if he showed symptoms on the flight, how come he didn't get quarantined right after the flight landed or go through customs and he got through customs and went home? I think this speaks to some of my concerns about what we're doing at our airport. So what we're doing at our airports right now is we are asking people, have you been to the affected part of the world? Have you had a fever? If so, please tell us and then we will consider quarantining you. And that is just not an effective method because people aren't honest. And something that I like to talk about whenever we talk about this outbreak is I was working during SARS and I was exposed to SARS and I was actually quarantined as a result of an exposure to SARS. And the reason why I was exposed is that the patient that I saw who had SARS lied about all of his exposure history. So he didn't tell us the truth about anything. And so we thought that we were safe and we went into a room with him unprotected. And next thing we found out a couple of days later is he had SARS and we were all exposed. And the learning from that, and we will never really know why this person lied. Um, by the time we found out it was SARS, they were critically ill and unable to breathe and on a respirator. So we'll never know why that patient lied. 
But the learning that I took away from that is that people in an outbreak scenario tend to not be completely honest because they have their own motivations. So somebody who's coming off of an airplane after a long flight, their motivation is they just want to get where they're trying to go. And they're not going to admit to something that might land in quarantine. So we need to be proactively at immigration tracking where people have come from and proactively screening for fever. I think that will make a big difference and that possibly would have stopped this case from coming into our community. Is Canada or does Canada do any research in finding a cure for coronavirus? Is it too early? I don't know if there are any specific efforts happening in Canada. Um, Canada has been active in many other outbreaks in terms of doing research around understanding viruses better and looking for how to manage them or how to treat them. One thing to be clear about when we're looking at this particular virus is coronaviruses are one of those most difficult strains of viruses to treat. So coronaviruses are the same family of viruses that causes the common cold, same family of viruses that caused SARS. And we have never really had any effective treatments for the common cold or any effective vaccines for the common cold or for any of those conditions. And the reason being is that this particular viruses, as I mentioned, is just incredibly adaptable and incredibly difficult to target. So when we try to actually research this virus, well, yes, it is nice to think about can we figure out a cure or a vaccine? What we really need to understand is how does it get transmitted? How do people get sick? What percentage of people are sick? How long are you infected? Is this something that you're only infectious when you have symptoms or you're infectious even before or after you have symptoms? Because these kind of things that allow us to know effectively who should be quarantined? How long should they be quarantined for? And this is how we set up an effective public health strategy to actually contain this outbreak. So that's the kind of research that I think we're all much more interested in right now versus trying to find a cure. What behaviors should people observe on public transit, particularly during rush hour when everyone is in very close quarters in order to reduce the risk of spread of this virus and other infectious diseases? So we don't 100% know the incubation period with certainty at this point. Uh, our guess is that it's about a couple of days. And the other thing that we don't really know at this point is whether or not patients are infectious during that incubation period or whether they only become infectious when they have symptoms. So, so these are all things that do need to be clarified still. Um, in terms of behaviors, the definition of an incubation period is that you have the virus, but you're not yet symptomatic. So you're not going to see any behaviors. Um, the person who's, who's incubating the virus doesn't know they're doing it. They're not going to be hiding their face or doing unusual things that make you say, whoa, I better get away from that person. Um, what I think you really want to do is exercise common sense, which is the same as what you would really want to do even during flu season, which is that if you're on public transit and, you know, there is somebody who, who gets on, on your transit car who is actively coughing and, and, you know, clearly ill or unwell appearing, this is probably not the person that you want to sit next to or even, you know, be within about a six foot radius of. Now, for the most part, most of the infectious viruses that are airborne, when you get at least, you know, six to 10 feet away, your chance of being infected goes down dramatically. So if you're sitting next to this person on the train, yes, you're at risk. If you're in the next car, you're probably going to be fine. Um, but what I, I think is common sense is just even during flu season, you see that person who's, you know, coughing up a lung on the, on the train, probably you might want to move down to another car or even get off that train. That would probably be my best advice. And, it, you know, if you happen to be near that person when they start coughing, you know, try to tell that person they shouldn't be there. That's the other thing. Nobody should be on public transit without wearing some sort of a surgical mask that they don't cough and spread virus around the train. Nobody should be doing that even during flu season. It's just a matter of, of just good decision making that you don't want to get an entire train full of people sick even with the flu, let alone coronavirus. What are the odds the virus becomes severe enough to cause death in a patient with the sickness? Again, we don't really know the odds that it will kill any particular patient. We don't even know the odds that you will even develop symptoms. But that being said, what we're starting to see is that of those patients that develop symptoms, um, and so this is really important, so we don't know what percentage of people who are infected will get symptoms, but of those people that get symptoms, we're seeing a fatality rate that's somewhere just above 10%. So it certainly is quite a deadly illness. Um, to put that in perspective, that's not far off of what we were seeing with SARS. So once you have symptoms, this is certainly a very concerning illness. Um, I think what is a little bit different between this and SARS, and again, this is preliminary, is that once people had symptoms of SARS, there were very few people that had mild symptoms with SARS. Most people who were infected, it was quite severe. Whereas what we're seeing with this illness is that many people who do have symptoms actually never have major symptoms. 
there are a small percentage of people who have very serious symptoms, and of those, we're seeing a fairly high fatality rate. There's lots we have to figure out about those rates, and also who are the patients that are getting sick in the early days. The thought was that only people with underlying medical conditions could potentially get very sick or die from this, but we have had a couple of recent support, recent reports of younger patients with no underlying health conditions dying from this illness. So we're really we're we're really reevaluating things as we go. Right now, there's lots to learn. Um, but overall, I would say to the average person out there, if you're exposed to this, your likelihood that this is going to be fatal to you is quite low because a small percentage of people, as far as we know, will die if they have symptoms. And there's a very good likelihood that a certain percentage of people will never have symptoms whatsoever.